Yeah. There you are again. Coffee cheers. It is officially Time to begin. 8.23 in the morning, Tuesday, March 21st, the year 2017. How the hell are you? It's your friend Malin. It's Tuesday. And uh, I did not post a video yesterday because I went on a wild adventure into Bob Marley land. <laughs> I've been going back and researching these older uh, generation of singers and people because um, I don't see a lot of inspiration in current music. Like I, I watched the new video from Drake, you know, or from The Weeknd, and I just don't, I don't draw anything from it. It sounds like it was built on a computer using um, music from, you know, say Michael Jackson stuff from the 70s. Like it's all become very much an echo chamber of the old stuff. So I'm just going back to the old stuff. And I went through Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, all these bands that I never really gave a chance and that have since turned into my new favorite bands. And then this Sunday, I was on Netflix and I've decided to do this new thing where I, I got in a habit where I was watching Netflix for like four hours a day. And, and I would watch things that I had already seen. So I would always have an episode of The Office playing or on YouTube, I would watch old Howard Stern videos with Beetlejuice that I've seen a thousand times. And I was just always watching that while I ate or while I was just sitting around. And I decided, wait a minute, like I'm taking all this time. I'm investing all this time into this nonsense. Let me inv what, if, what if I invested it into stuff that made me smarter, like educational things? So instead of watching The Office reruns that I've seen a thousand times, I watch documentaries that I've never seen. Or instead of watching Howard Stern videos that I've seen a thousand times, even though I love Beetlejuice, I will get on Duolingo and practice my Spanish. I'm about a month into my Spanish with Duolingo. So I'm just taking the time that I waste, and you probably do this too, we all waste four to five, six, seven hours a day. Instead of screwing around on Facebook or watching Netflix reruns, Watch something educational or do something educational or teach yourself something with that same time. And what you'll find is you can do a lot more with the time that you already have just by removing the nonsense. Anyway, so this trip led me down the path of I was on Netflix. I looked for documentaries and a Bob Marley documentary uh, popped up. I don't remember the name of it, but I will link to it in the description after this video because now I feel bad. I don't remember the name, but I watched, I've, I, I've always liked Bob Marley, but it's kind of like Pink Floyd. I knew the hits. I knew the big songs. I listened to the albums at parties, but I never sat down and really put on a pair of headphones and studied this person or listened to some interviews on YouTube or watched a documentary. When you do that, it completely changes the way you look at an artist or a band, or anyone, when you know the backstory. I always thought of Bob Marley as being this, like, uh, rebellious, super talented, spiritual type of guy that had a band, that played reggae, and that they brought reggae out of Jamaica and spread it to the world. That was kind of what I thought Bob Marley was, but I had no idea what had actually happened with this guy. And if you haven't seen his story, if you don't know his story, the first thing that blew my mind is that Bob Marley was half white. He was half white and half black. His dad was a white German, and his mother was a black Jamaican. And the dad was in the military, and he traveled the world, and he was stationed in Jamaica. He saw this 16-year-old girl in the village, liked the way she looked, and, had a, and got her pregnant. They hooked up. He left town. She had Bob Marley. The, the man's last name, the, the military guy's last name was Marley. Something like Norval, Norval Marley. 
So that's the first thing I had no clue. I mean, who would have thought Bob Marley was actually mixed white and black? That just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. But it even made more sense of to, as to why he was such a unique and powerful human being was because he didn't just embody, it wasn't just power for Jamaicans. It was power for everyone. He wanted his music to be heard and accepted and understood, and he wanted to spread the message to every single person, regardless of religion, color, race, gender, all of that. Who cares? He wanted everyone to hear it. That's the first thing that blew my mind. And then I thought, what else do I not know? And then they went through the, his whole story, and it was insane, man. By the time that America found out who Bob Marley was, this guy had already gone through several band changes, several albums, a couple of, uh, you know, some bad record deals where they'd gotten ripped off, even though they were the number one artists in Jamaica, they were being paid at the time three pounds a week each. And if you asked for more money, the record label was run by a gangster who was surrounded by thugs. And if you asked for your money, they would just kill you. Like everyone knew you don't ask for your money. You take your three pounds and you'd be happy you can eat. And he takes the lion's share of the cash. So, uh, and all this happened before we ever, before his big gigantic albums and, and stadium tours in America even happened. He, th he was a, uh, they tried to kill him. I didn't know this, but when Bob was in Jamaica, before America, before we ever, before it blew up here, he had already gone through, he was the biggest artist there. He was seen as a revolutionary. And there were two like political sides or two thought sides. I don't know how to describe it, actually. One was like the PNP and one was something else. But there were two sides. Let's say they're Democrat or let's say they're Republicans and Democrats, right? Kind of just two opposite sides. But they were at civil war. They were killing each other on a daily basis. There were wars going on in the streets. And they all liked Bob's music because he was such a badass, right? And Bob liked all of them. He was friends with both sides. He didn't care. He didn't want to pick a side or get involved in the war. He was with everyone, remember? And they hated this. And they told him. They instructed him. They said, look, man, if you don't choose a side, you're, there's a chance you're going to get hurt. And you can't be in the middle. You have to choose a side. And he was like, I'm not choosing a side. And so there's a story where Bob was going to do this gigantic show in town. And it was um, deceptively attached to a political party. The guy kind of asked Bob to do the show. He said yes. Then the guy announced a campaign to run for president or whatever it was. And then by association, by doing the show, Bob was kind of associated with this guy and people got pissed off. There in Jamaica, both sides were pissed off. No one knew who, where his allegiances were. And so one of the sides, or possibly both of the sides, set out a plan to kill him, just to kill him so that the concert wouldn't happen. And they ran up to his house, like the, the day of or the day before the show, poked their gun through a door without even going in and just shot everyone in the place, turned around and shot his wife and a bunch of people that were in cars in front of the house, just shot everyone. Like his manager got shot, Bob got hit, it came across his chest and the bullet lodged in his arm. And they said if he had been inhaling instead of exhaling the bullet would have it would have killed him it would have hit him in the heart but he was blowing out of breath and that brought his chest back just enough for the bullet to pass by and hit him in the arm but this all went down before we even knew who he was and what's crazy is he decided to do the show anyway went out on the stage either the next day or shortly after the shooting opened up his shirt and showed the crowd where the bullet had come across his chest and hit him in the arm he showed him and then he did the show like you know Screw it, I'm doing the show anyway. He said that God would protect him or Jah would protect him. Same thing, God, Jah, it's all the same. But there, there's just myriads of things I had no clue about, man, and that's one of them. I had no idea of the... I mean, I always love a good comeback story, and that's what Bob Marley's story is. It's a comeback story. It's a kid who grew up in a village called Trenchtown. And when you see, I mean, we've all heard in No Woman, No Cry, he says, in a government yard in Trenchtown. But I never went and looked at what Trenchtown looks like. But in the documentary, they showed it. And it looks like a dump. Like they built little shacks and shanties out of metal and blankets and, you know, dirt floors. The kids running around with no shoes, just a pair of shorts, you know, 
He said they, some nights they didn't have food at all, like you drank water before you went to bed after not eating all day. You would drink water before bed, so maybe something in your stomach so you could maybe sleep, like it was rough. And then him and some little kids from the village started, you know, playing music. One of them was named Peter Tosh. Like, the whole thing blew my mind. They all came from this little, this little, well, he came from Trenchtown. I guess he moved to the other place, and that's where he found the other guys. But anyway, you've got to watch the, the documentary if you're into comeback stories at all, and into music, and into starting from zero, and going somewhere huge. Like, Bob Marley started in a dump just a dump of a village like z at a, he started at zero no shoes you know what i mean no food and he built he accomplished more before his death at 36 than most people do in their lifetimes and most people who start with millions of dollars in the at to, at their disposal you know he he did it all that's another thing i didn't know is that he uh died of cancer at 36 and, and the story behind that, um, he was like playing soccer and he hurt his toe. The doctor went to check it out. He went to the doctor to check it out. They said, you actually have some cancer cells in your toe and we're going to have to remove your leg is what they told him. And he said, I can't do that because I want to dance with my music. So they went to another doctor and this doctor said, well, we don't, we don't have to remove your leg, but we can remove your toe. He said, no, I can't remove my toe because then I can't dance either. They, they told him, they said, if you remove your toe, you won't be able to dance. He said, I'm not doing that. So he found a doctor who just simply removed his toenail, put a Band-Aid on it, and then he went back on tour. And that cancer that they had discovered grew and grew and grew till it covers his entire body. And the day, I think it was, don't quote me on this, I just watched the documentary a few days ago, but I, I think... Bob Marley's a genius. He was trying, he had broken into America. He was already huge in Europe, Jamaica, um, Africa, a couple other places. He was a god. Then he came to America and he took over America. He became very huge here as well, but the audience was white. The black audience didn't accept him. And he wanted the black audience in America. He wanted everyone. He wanted everyone to accept and hear and understand the music and the message. And uh, the, his manager ended up getting a call from the, the, the Commodores, maybe, uh, I think it was, who at the time, it was either the, maybe it was the Commodores, one of these big, big bands from that era. And they called Bob's manager and said, we want you to open, we want Bob to open our tour. And the manager kind of laughed and he said, I'll talk to Bob. He went to Bob and he said, look, man, we're bigger than these guys. They should be opening for us. And Bob thought about it. He said, nah, man, let's do this. I don't have a problem with that. He said, okay. So they went and they booked a tour. And what Bob knew was if they could get in front of the Commodore's audience, it was going to be 99.999% black. And this was his shot. So he sucked it up, did the opening slot, took the shot. I believe the first show was at Madison Square Garden. And he did the show. The people were skeptical at the beginning. And then by the end of the show, the entire sold-out stadium was sweating and crying and rocking out to Bob Marley. They had no clue. And then that was it. He had, he, now he had everyone on his side. And I believe it was after that show, they went for a run the next day, and uh, Bob collapsed and started shaking and foaming at the mouth. They took him to the hospital, and they found out he was loaded with cancer. It had spread all over his body. And then the rest of his life, I think they did one more show after that. And then the rest of his life was spent trying to live. Like he went to several doctors and all these things. And then the cancer ultimately took him down at age 36. But I didn't know that. I didn't know about any of that. I also, check this out. The lifestyle is so beautiful. And I'm going to try to paint this picture for you. But in the, in the documentary, the, the feeling I came away with was in the morning... What they did was, and they talk about this, they woke up, got stoned, got really high, and then um, went and did a run, like they would run or exercise in some way. Then they would come back and write music. So his morning routine or whatever was wake up, get blasted, run, exercise, work yourself, you know, get your heart pumping. And then he would come back with the, the weed and the exercise, and then he would start singing and the words would come out. 
but it just painted a picture of like a really cool lifestyle of waking up, getting high or not getting high, just waking up, exercising, like running up through the hills. They would bathe in waterfalls and let the water massage the back and like get high up there and then run down and have a really healthy meal. They ate this um, diet called um, ital, I think it's called. It's based on the word vital, I believe. So maybe it's ital. But it was all natural foods, you know. Um, some of them ate meat, some of them didn't. But And then they, you know, they just ate these healthy foods, bathed under waterfalls, exercised, hung around their friends. They played soccer, they played music, and there was always a group of them. You know, it was just a beautiful lifestyle. Imagine, like you could do it by the beach in America. You could just uh, live by the beach, have four or five friends, wake up every morning, get stoned or not, drink coffee, whatever. Wake up, go run the beach, come back eat some food, sing some songs, then run up the mountain and take a shower under the waterfall. and You know, do that every day and your whole life would change. Like, that's what those guys are doing out there in Malibu. That's what Woody Harrelson and God knows what they're doing out there. Willie Nelson and all those guys. They're having a blast out there. Although I did read an article yesterday that Woody Harrelson said he stopped smoking pot a year ago, which was shocking. But he said he'd been partying too hard for 30 years and he needed just needed a break. He was by no means saying pot's bad. He's just saying, I've been partying extraordinarily hard for 30 years, and I, I needed a mental break, so that's cool. But anyway, that lifestyle to me, it, it gave me a good um, a compass to look forward to. Like, that's what I really want to do. That's the dream. It's not living in, this, in a big city, driving around to business meetings all day and you know, expensive restaurants and clothing shopping and all this bullshit. It's waking up with some friends, drinking some coffee, getting your mind right, going for a run, go look at the beach, climb a mountain, play in the waterfall, you know, come back down the hill, sing songs till the sun goes down, and then cook dinner, you know, and then go to bed. That's it. That's a good day. All the rest is, is ridiculous. Anyway, it's really helping me. Maybe it'll help you too. If, if nothing else, if you're a fan of, you know, Get up, stand up, you know, the hits, no woman, no cry, these kind of hits. If you're a fan of those songs, you should really check out this documentary. Number one, to give you some more, some extra insight into the amazing life of this guy and what happened with him. But number two is just to give yourself some inspiration about a, to see another person come from that far down and then go to almost not even almost, a legendary status that's going to last probably for all time. I mean, I could see people talking about Bob Marley in 100 years from now and in 500 years from now. That's a hell of an accomplishment for a kid with no shoes running around in trench town in the dirt, you know, wondering where his next meal is going to come from. But you, you, you almost have to have that backstory to create the success that he had in the way that he had it. And that's the message for everyone, man. For me, that's what I pulled from it. I keep pulling from it. And that is without the beginning struggle, without that struggle in the beginning, and we're talking about being poor, your parents are divorced. Maybe you were born with a uh, blind, or maybe you were hit by a car and you lost a leg, or maybe you just didn't have any money. Whatever it is, every great comeback story starts with someone who's lost unhappy depressed and poor and broke and confused and going nowhere so if you're there now i've been there i'm still there sometimes but if you're there now feel good because what that could mean is you're on the verge of of making that breakthrough look man bob marley could have stayed in his village and become like the best pencil maker there or whatever he could have been the best hut builder they ever saw and stayed there and lived his life or whatever. But he said, you know what? I'm going to take this rough circumstance and I'm going to use it as material for my, for my songs. And I'm going to spread the word about my story, the village's story, Jamaica's story, Rasta's story, all of this stuff. I'm going to tell everyone. And at the same time, I'm going to get myself out of here. I'm going to change this thing. And Bob didn't just leave and forget where he came from. He came back often. He only left when they tried to kill him, you know. But he would come back and they said lines would go down the block. And Bob would be passing out money to people. Not, a, not small amounts either. If they needed to start a business, he'd give them the money. If they needed to pay back a loan, he'd just give them the cash in Jamaica. Really inspirational story. And really good to see that someone that far down could go that far up. Because if he could do it, that means we could do it. If he could do it, that means we could do it. 
If he could do it, that means we could do it. I love that. I just made that up. If he could do it, we could do it. Why not? I mean, the only difference is he picked up his guitar and focused. They said he wrote music constantly. He found something that, that he loved. He played it. He did it constantly. His mom said that when she moved to America, Bob moved to America later and moved into her basement and was working as a janitor at a hotel. And she said that she would write letters home to Bob's wife. And uh, she would say, he's doing okay, but all he does is sit down in that basement and play his damn guitar. Like he had found a friend that had some congas, some kungas, whatever. And they played together eight hours a day. She said they just play all day, as, as often as they can. And that was inspirational too. It's like you've, you have to be, you, you're lost, you find something, then you focus on it immensely with all of your time and energy because it's your only shot. And then hopefully something good comes of it. And even if you don't become Bob Marley and make tens of millions of dollars and leave a legacy that lasts eternally, even if you don't accomplish that, if you just can get out of your, that bad situation and help a few other people out as well, then the mission's accomplished. You know, That's all that it takes. That's success. Starting from here, getting to here, then helping some more people get to here where you are. You know what I mean? That's a huge success. And if the rest happens and you end up inventing the new computer or you write songs that make you hundreds of millions of dollars, that's all icing on the cake. That's all icing on the cake, man. But that's all it takes. So if you're stuck, good. I've, I've been stuck. I used it as a launch pad, like a phoenix rising from the flame or whatever. If you're stuck now, use that as your launch pad and get to work, man, because it's on you. No one's coming to save you. Barack Obama didn't save you. Trump won't save you. Hillary Clinton can't save you. No one's going to save you but you. No one's going to save your family but you. No one's going to save you but yourself. And today's a pretty good day to start. I mean, sun's not out. It's, it's cloudy. But there's something. there's got to be something you could do. Got to be something I could do. And I'm going to figure that out right after I turn this off. We're at 22 minutes, man. It's time to go. I hope you're having a beautiful day. It's Tuesday, March 21st. 2017 is already disappearing. As is my day and my morning. So with that, I'm going to go. If you have a question, comment, concern, prayer request, put it in the comments below. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Coffee cheers on the way out. Boom. See you.